Hello and welcome back to the Complete Guide to Spin at the Rock Road Academy. Today we're taking a look at the Node.js SDK. Much like the other SDK walkthroughs, we're going to cover everything that you need to get started writing your first WebAssembly microservice with Fermion Spin. Let's dive right in. Alright, let's get started with the Node.js SDK. The most common things that you'll need to do with the Spin SDK is your first endpoint. When you run Spin New, it generates a simple endpoint that just says, hello. I'll guide you through the code that is involved and the setup to get that running locally. Next, we'll grab some HTTP request headers, then the body, then the query params, and lastly, we'll speak to another service. When you start to build out your microservices, you're inevitably going to want to speak to, well, one, other microservices, or two, other things on the internet. But I'll show you how to get started using Spin's SDK for outbound HTTP connections. If you need any help, please feel free to drop into the comment section. I'll keep an eye on it, and I'll do my best to help you get on your way. So let's start looking at code. So the first thing we want to do is run pmpm and so on, or whatever package manager you prefer to use. Now that we have our dependencies, we can pop open our index.ts. You'll see here that the Spin SDK exposes handle request, HTTP request, and HTTP response. The handle request is just a type definition that describes the function that handles an HTTP request and spits back an HTTP response. HTTP request and HTTP response are just objects that allow us to grab information about the request and the response. Simple. Now, because we're using TypeScript today, we have really great language server protocol and our IDEs understand the code inside and out. You can click on HTTP response and you'll see the interface definition. The only thing to note is that our body is an array buffer. If you're not familiar with the semantics of WebAssembly, essentially everything is an array of integers or bytes. I think that's right. So we can't just throw text back down the pipe. Hence, we use the text encoder to encode a string value into the array buffer. Other than that, you're just writing standard TypeScript code. Let's run this and see what it looks like. We can run spin build to compile our WebAssembly module. We can then run spin up with follow all and make our first request to our Node.js service. Now that's going to return a 404 because as you can see at the top of my screen, the endpoint that we need is slash hello. Now we have our hello from the Node.js SDK and that's pretty sweet. All right, let's take a look at headers. First thing we want to do is grab our header, or at least a header that we're going to provide, called xname. I'm just going to pass my own name in as a request header, and we're going to transform it and propagate it back onto the response, and then include it in the body. Super exciting. Now, we're going to add some debug here name is xname, like so. Word of warning, console.debug is not supported in spin with the spin SDK. So you'll get function not found. Now let's modify the response headers to include xname, where we do xname and we'll transform it just to uppercase. Nothing exciting, but enough that we're doing something with it we can see visually. We can see on our response. Lastly, we'll update the body. Like so. There is a few things to note here. One, this is standard TypeScript code. With the exception of console.debug, nothing else here is unique. We assign with const and assignment. We're using string functions on strings. And we have 
template literals where we can interpolate variables. All standard Node.js, JavaScript, TypeScript stuff. Your dev loop is to run spin build and spin up. And I would encourage that you add follow all so you can see the logs on the console. This will compile your program to a WebAssembly module or binary where we can run curl. I'm adding dash v so that we can see the response headers. And I'm going to add my own header on the request. And we'll set that to David. Now we can request localhost 3000 slash hello, which is the endpoint that we have configured in the spin.toml. We'll take a look at that in just a second. As you can see here, our console printed name is David. We can see the response header of X name is David in uppercase, as well as the original X name of David in the body response. Now, the other thing to note here is that the HTTP framework as part of Spins SDK always lower cases all of the headers. Even though I passed it in as X name like so, this would actually give us an error and a crash because that key does not exist on the object or the record. So just keep that in mind. Always lowercase your header names. So that's headers. Hopefully nice and simple, but nice to understand how to fetch them and how to use them. Okay, let's understand the request body. Let's do body equals request body. If we hover over the variable, we get our intelligent information from the IDE that this is either an array buffer or undefined. So let's do good error checking. And if we don't have a body, we'll return a 400 and say this is a bad request. Now, if we do console log bot body, not to print it out, but just to understand where the TypeScript compiler thinks we are, we can hover over and we'll see that it's narrowed the scope of the type. And now knows that beyond this point, we always have an array buffer. And in fact, let's actually run this and see what we get on the terminal. So we're gonna run spin build, spin up, follow up. There's a pattern here. Next, we'll run the curl and we'll just keep the same stuff that we had from the previous request. And you'll see here that we have an object array buffer. We're not actually getting a string. Again, WebAssembly works with integers and bytes. So let's get a string. The easiest way to do this is to say body string equals buffer dot from passing in our body and calling to a string. Now we can do a console log of body string and for good measure, we can include it on the body response. We come back, we build and we wait. And why does it look like nothing happened? Well, nothing did. We can see a blank line coming through. What do we need to do? Include a body. So let's do dash D and we'll pass through an empty JSON object. Now we can see that the body is printed above in the logs and as well as in a response on the bottom. Perfect. So let's take a look at one more thing before we move on to query strings. I'm going to define an interface called request body. And this, I'm going to have a string name. Down here, I'm going to say that my request body is equal to my request.json. Now we haven't done any type matching here, which means we don't get autocomplete on our request body. But the JSON function will parse the body of its JSON. Now, we can't just say that this is our request body. What we actually need to do here 
can choose TypeScript's concept of as a request body. Now, down here, we can say got the name request body with autocomplete name. So let's run spin build and send a curl request, this time passing through the body with JSON. And we got the name David. So let's send a curl request, this time with that and we get undefined. So it's always wise to remember that while you're developing and writing in TypeScript, that all that type information disappears off to the ether at runtime. So if you do need to make sure your types are valid at runtime, I recommend checking out Zod. You can do pmpm install Zod. From there, you can define your Zod object. You can say that our request body equals Zod object, which has a shape of Zod string. Now, instead of defining our interface as a duplication, we can remove this and we can say type request body zod and fair type of request body so now we have two definitions of request body in the same scope one is a value and one is a type and that's okay in typescript so we can choose to leave this as it is but use our request body value to do a parse on the object and see if it's valid and you can see Copilot is already there with the answer. So let's recompile and send our field request once the server is listening. And now we have a big large error telling us that our types are invalid. This may not be the best approach, especially for production systems. So you can change this to safe parts. Now this won't crash, but you will have to evaluate the response. You can then use response.success to decide if you need to continue or present the user with an error. So Zod is really cool. If you need runtime type safety in your Node.js microservices, check it out. Let's move on to query strings. Now, there's nothing special provided for you to handle a query string. You will have to parse it through regular Node.js code, which means we're going to have to pull in the QS library. You can do pmpm install QS. From here, we can import star as QS from QS. Like so. Now that we have QS, we can parse the query string. Let's do const query string equals QS.parse. Now the thing that's important to remember here, that we have a request URI, but the query string library splits on the ampersand, which means we still have the path in there. So we have to manually split the path off. So we can just do split based on question mark and then grab the right hand side. Next, we can just do console log and say, hello, limit, limit, like so. So let's set our limit to be equal to query string dot limit. We'll let Copilot pick a default of 10. Now we can use the syntax because if we click on parse, we see it returns a parsed queues. And this is just a string indexable object. So this should just work. So let's build and run. We can do spin build, up, and follow. We can now do curl, localhost, 3000, 
flash loop. And we see the default limit of 10. In order to change this, we have to quote our URL because of the question mark. And set limit equals five. And as you can see on the top, we have the query string parsed and our limit processed. All right, last but not least, outbound HTTP. You'll be pleased to know that you just get to use the regular fetch API. What does that mean? Well, it means we get a const response equals await fetch, thank you copilot. And let's actually just grab google.com. That's it. You'll see here we have a response with a fetch result. So let's grab the response body, which equals await response dot text. There's nothing new here. You don't need to learn anything else. This is standard fetch API. Let's do a console dot log response body. Next, guess what we're going to run? Spin, build, up, follow. And we'll do a nice simple request to localhost 3000. Hello. Now, if you've seen the other walkthroughs of the other SDKs, you'll see that we always hit destination not allowed. Spin ships with secure defaults, which mean you can only make outbound requests to domains and destinations that you specifically allow. We can modify that in the spin.toml. So let's pop over to here. Each component that you have can define the allowed HTTP host. From here, we can set google.com. Let's run our spin, build up, and replicate our car request, like so. And as you can see on the server logs at the top, we have the output from google.com being console.log. Now, if you don't want to restrict outbound access and you want to allow anything for whatever reason, I promise, I don't judge. You can change allowed HTTP hosts to be insecure colon allow dash all. This will allow you to request any website that you want. That's it. We've covered the Node.js specifically with TypeScript SDK for spin. I hope you found this useful. If so, jump into the comments. If you run into problems, jump into the comments. And if you want to see more videos like this, click thumb up, subscribe, and go check out Fermion Spin. Happy hacking. I'll see you next time.